Thank you so much, Anna. So welcome, everyone, to this webinar hosted by the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights about resisting police militarization. Uh, my name is Rama Kudani. I'm the Director of Grassroots Organizing um, here at the U.S. Campaign. And our webinar tonight is going to focus on the use of military equipment and tactics by law enforcement officers, uh, how local communities are fighting back against this, and why this is an important issue for those of us who are concerned and working in support of Palestinian rights. Um, in recent years, uh, funding for this kind of militarization of police has oftentimes been provided by the Department of Homeland Security through a program called Urban, Secu Urban Area Securities Initiative, um, which is meant to be fighting um, terrorism, quote unquote. And it highlights just one of the many intersections we see between the war on terror and police brutality against black and brown communities here in the United States. And we see that organizing also against this police militarization is also part of like kind of the overall fight against US militarism at home and abroad, which also includes obviously US support for Israel's oppression of Palestinians. Um, many times a lot of these um, trainings and weapons expos that are happening across the country um, for US police are attended by Israeli and international police military units. Um, and we are honored today to be joined by three activists who have been part of different organizing efforts against police militarization. Our first um, presenter is going to be Tara Tabasi, who is a national organizer of the War Resisters League in New York City and campaigns against police militarizations and the armed trade. Um, she will kick off the webinar with giving us kind of some examples of what we mean when we say police militarizations and how we can oppose this. And our next two presenters are going to share specific examples of community resistance. So we have Lara Kiswani, who is the Executive Director of the Arab Resource and Organizing Center and has been part of Stop Urban Shield, which is a coalition of organizations in the Bay Area that have united against Urban Shield, a SWAT team training and weapons expo that brings together police military units to collaborate on new forms of surveillance, state repression, and state violence. And finally, we're going to have Leila, who's a Palestinian artist and organizer and a core member of For the People, For the People Artists Collective in Chicago, which focuses on integrating art into organizing practices. Uh, last October, activists in Chicago confronted the Israel, uh, the Illinois Tactical Officers Association conference there. Um, which um, features the notorious Islamophobe uh, Sebastian Gorka as a keynote speaker, who we um, now know serves as a deputy assistant to Donald Trump. So thank you all for joining us um, tonight. I'm going to um, pass it on to Tara and make you a presenter so you can join, uh, share your screen. You should be able to share your screen now. Thank you, Rama, and uh, thank you to the U.S. campaign for hosting this webinar on police militarization uh, tonight. Uh, so my name is Tara, and I'm a national organizer with the War Sisters League. Um, we, we are a 95-year-old organization working to resist war and its root causes. Um, and then specifically tonight, I'm going to be talking about our national campaign to uh, end police militarization called No SWAT Zone. Um, so after organizing against uh, tear gas being used globally by police departments uh, since the Arab Spring of 2011, uh, War Sisters League has seeded seven cro uh, cross-community coalitional efforts uh, to build resistance across the country against a little known but very key part of police militarization, uh, which are SWAT trainings. Um, SWAT trainings are often a major driver uh, of the escalated police militarization that we see in, in poor communities of color and against protesters and water protectors across the country. Um, so today I'm going to start the web, I'm going to open up the webinar uh, with talking about what police militarization is, uh, go into uh, what SWAT trainings are, um, and then kind of talk about the essential elements of SWAT trainings as well as the essential elements um, of resisting SWAT trainings. So uh, a fun presentation, hopefully. Um, so, oh, there we go. So, uh, to start off, uh, what is police militarization? So, very crudely, uh, police militarization is uh, where the police and military intersect in weaponry, equipment, um, funding, and tactics. 
So uh, its most obvious form is where the use of force industry is creating material specifically for police, which arms dealers sell at weapons expos. Um, however, it's really easy to get caught up in the flashy parts of police militarization, so like, you know, the, the assault rifles, the uh, armored personnel carriers. Um, but uh, instead, we should look also beyond the weaponry and the surveillance equipment uh, to, the, to the cultures and mentalities and what, what are what we call militarized cultures and mentalities um, uh, at that. Um, because there we can find militarism's uh, less overt and obvious forms. Um, so whether that's like humor or, or swag or um, gaming culture, um, the, these types of like uh, less obvious forms of militarism uh, that, uh, that rely on cultures of fear, that rely on us versus them um, kind of mentalities, heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, um, kind of uh, by, by exposing that, um, um, then we can see the ways that law enforcement officers are intentionally trained uh, and we can begin to unpack uh, both the, 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 the tactics um, and cultures but also the systems that are holding it in place. So kind of both overt and mundane forms of militarism um, are things that Palestinians and Palestine solidarity activists know very well. Um, so, so maybe to start us off, uh, how do we get to where we are today? Um, so while the while U.S. policing is rooted in the maintenance of settler colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade, police militarization in the kind of form that we're going to talk about today was really further institutionalized when Reagan passed the Military Cooperation with Law Enforcement Act of 1981. Um, and that's really what kind of kickstarted the war on drugs. And so the war on drugs marked higher rates of lethal force with the transfer of military equipment to police departments. Um, and it was specifically for targeting communities of color, poor communities, and frequent, frequently used to police the black liberation movement and anti-war activists. Um, and so, you know, you had the war on drugs and you combined it with the post 9-11 US Patriots Act, um, expansion of law enforcement surveillance, and the subsequent federal funding of military equipment and tactics, which was the war on terror, combined them together, and we have where we are today, police militarization. So getting to this key part of police militarization, uh, which is SWAT. So what's SWAT? It's an acronym. It stands for Special Weapons and Tactics. It actually used to be called Special Weapons Attack Teams. Um, and it was really like the brainchild of, the, of an LAPD inspector uh, named Daryl Gates, who in 1967 uh, uh, built this idea based on his policing of black uprisings, such as the Watts riots. Um, so if you notice like in this corner here, this graph, um, SWAT raids in 1980 um, were approximately around eight per day. But now where you see where we're at today, the approximate number of SWAT raids that are in the United States are 137 raids. So this is not a subtle increase that we've seen. And then to understand a little bit more about what SWAT raids are and who they impact, 79% um, of SWAT raids are to search an individual's home. Um, and 42% of SWAT raids are targeting black people, 12% Latinx people, um, and half of all SWAT killings that uh, in this particular study that the New York Times recently did this week um, were people of color. So you can see disproportionately who SWAT raids is, is impacting. Um, and then also you can see how the use of paramilitary tactics is being used for like pretty individual and, and, and small scale um, like criminal raiding. Um, so, uh, it's, it's, it's thus not a surprise that SWAT teams, um, who are the foot, foot soldiers of the war on drugs, have historically brought a war-making mentality to the daily practice of, of policing and arrest. And if you can recall the murder of a seven-year-old black girl in Detroit, Ayanna Jones, um, who was murdered by a flash grenade being thrown through uh, the front window of her home, um, you can abundantly see the, the clear how war mentalities are enacted through SWAT killings. Um, so this is specifically why War Resisters League targets SWAT trainings, um, and also how we see everyday policing uh, and police violence as part of militarism um, at large. So SWAT raids would not be possible without SWAT trainings. Um, so I hope this uh, isn't like too much to, <laughs> to look at, but um, 
So SWAT trainings and weapons expos, they happen 365 days a, 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 a year all over the world and actually are a growing national, regional, and international phenomena. Um, so what this graph is supposed to show, or what this diagram is supposed to show, um, is that the arrows are kind of the external factors that are, that are kind of either funding or allowing for a SWAT training to happen. Um, and then the, the circles within the, the, the red larger box are kind of the key elements um, or, or, or actors that are, are at a SWAT training and weapons expo. Um, so the things I'll pull out from this are first, in the bottom corner, Rama mentioned UASI, the Urban Area Security Initiative. That's a major funder of SWAT trainings and weapons expos, but there are actually many more uh, Department of Home and Security grants that, that allow for them to happen. I think later we'll probably talk about UASI a bit because it's the main funder of Urban Shield. Um, other things that other other funders that allow SWAT trainings to happen are association dues for the tactical officers associations that that host SWAT trainings, um, sponsors uh, from civilian or arms dealer companies, um, um, as well as attendance fees and and kind of vendor fees. Um, another thing I will draw out is uh, in the upper corner by trainers is curriculum and scenarios. So um, uh, police departments come to SWAT trainings from around the world, often our SWAT teams coming from around the world, and, and together they, they uh, do exercises and competitions to see who's the best SWAT team, but also to try out the new weaponry. Um, and, and besides having scenarios, there's also workshops. So for example, at NITOAC, which is the New York Tactical Officers Association Conference that happened this year in Syracuse, there was a workshop entitled the Negotiating the Mad, the Bad, the Sad. So that was um, specifically just for encouraging uh, SWAT teams to, to take control in, in, in scenarios where there's a mental health crisis as opposed to medical professionals. Or for example at ENTOA, National Tactical Officers Association, which is a national training that travels around the United States, um, there was a workshop called Talk, Fight, Shoot, Leave, which encouraged use of force solutions and warrior mentalities instead of de-escalation tactics. Um, and then finally, just if you look in the middle, there's like a red box. Um, really, how, what we see uh, SWAT trainings as are factories that produce, that rely on the fear of Muslim terror to justify black and Latinx death through SWAT raids and policing. Um, and, and, and once you start to unpack the different pieces that are at play in SWAT trainings, this, this equation becomes abundantly um, clear. Oh, I'm going to shut off my webcam to allow for, okay, is everything okay? I hope so. Okay, um, so, so moving on. Uh, <laughs> yay, okay, good. Um, so SWAT trainings are, have a lot of key elements, are in a pretty, and are a complex recipe. But luckily, we also have a complex recipe for resisting them. Hey. Um, so I'm not going to go too deep into this model, um, uh, because I assume that a lot of uh, the audience today are activists and organizers. And this, this is kind of what I'm presenting to you here is like a basic model of resisting SWAT trainings, which follows a basic model of like a pressure campaign. Um, but uh, I think from, um, from seeding cross-community coalitions in Boston, Louisville, Syracuse, San Diego, New York City, uh, Bay Area, and Chicago. Um, we have followed this basic model, and it's worked really, uh, it's worked quite well. Um, so I'm going to highlight a few things from it. Um, one is because SWAT trainings and weapons expos um, are, are, are such an intersection of policing and militarism. It also means that this, that the, this issue uh, impacts a, an array of community members. Um, so I think the first, if you look at like the 12 o'clock on the diagram, the 1 o'clock says build cross-community coalition. So after you found a SWAT training um, in your town or city, uh, it's time to build a cross-community coalition. And specifically what this means is it's a great opportunity for non-black Muslims in the United States to work in accountable coalitions with black and Latinx community members. It also provides a great ground for building resistance led by poor and working class people because of the content of the workshops, it often um, can be a great way to, to lift up folks who are organizing around mental health. Um, so so um, once you've built your cross-community coalition, if you look at the next point there, it says develop messaging. 
the kind of two takeaways that War Sisters has through No SWAT Zone is um, as we're developing messaging around police militarization expos, it's really easy to go down two path, these kind of easy pathways of messaging, and we want to encourage uh, us to not do that. One is to just get really focused on, on the Islamophobic aspects of the training, because there's often like an ideologue, demagogue, whatever what we call it, um, speaking like Gorka or like Ryan Mauro. Um, it's really easy to get caught up in the Islamophobia that's being produced um, in SWAT trainings. Um, and so let us not forget, though, who is being impacted by SWAT raids in police in the United States, uh, which is predominantly black and Latinx communities. Um, and then secondly, the kind of easy pathway to go down on messaging is uh, to use this kind of empty metaphor of the war at home. So because SWAT raids and police militarization create uh, contexts that are, are war-like, um, it's often easy to use that as a metaphor. Um, but I think we have found that when we're wanting to really build internationalism and connect with uh, those activists and organizers and people who are living under war and in, in violent conflict, um, it's really important not to be making those kind of like uh, generalizations. Um, and then finally, if you like swing around the m circle and you see at the end it says expand coalition, re-strategize, join no SWAT zone. Um, so it depends. If you're working on a training that's in your town or city every year, then you know it's important to keep re-strategizing, building out your coalition. But if you're working on a training that's moving from city to city, it's really, really uh, great to think about gathering all the research that you've done um, and, and reaching out to activists in that city to be passing it on so that we can keep like building a national momentum against trainings. Um, so uh, in addition to working uh, you know, in seven local campaigns um, the past few years against SWAT trainings, we also uh, uh, in this past year worked on a national level. So with 35 community and national groups, um, we called on the House Appropriations Committee, which is like the group that's in the House and the Senate that decide budgets, and specifically they decide the budgets for DHS's uh, UASI budget. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and last year, luckily, Obama was uh, suggesting to cut that budget, so we were really pushing for this committee to keep that cut. So we weren't successful, um, but we want to do it again, and I think there's a lot of room for discussion around what's changed with the Trump administration, um, but if you're interested, hit me up. Um, and then kind of as to close out, the, the things that we're really thinking that we're needing right now is like a national police militarization movement, um, is that it, while, um, as, we're strength, as local co co uh, coalitions and campaigns are strengthening, it, it's becoming really, really important to coordinate across those local coalitions, whether that's sharing tactics, um, or whether that's sharing national targets such as UASI, um, and also that we're in search for a national champion, so someone that will champion our cause in the House um, or Senate, and, um, and you know, we're needing help uh, to find that person. Join us. Um, so yeah, join our SWAT zone. Um, that can look like many ways. That can look like finding a SWAT training in your town or city. Um, you can hit up WRL for help with research and strategy. Or if you want to join No SWAT Zone and help us research and strategize on a national level, we, we need many more people. We would love to have you. And then finally, um, we have a project called SWAT Stories uh, with the Stop Urban Shield Coalition uh, and Stop ITOA. Um, and what that is doing is that uh, it's calling on media makers to lift up the experience of those being raided um, and expose the, the impacts of SWAT raids uh, on black and Latinx communities across the United States. Um, and poor communities and those who are being raided. So uh, feel free to email me if you want to join in any of those ways. Um, and I guess just like as a final uh, point is that um, so No SWAT Zone has uh, complete, has transformed War Resisters League and I think um, through that we're like learning about the ways that we can also transform the anti-war and anti-militarist movement in the United States um, that has been that has been weak for some time and needs some remedies. Um, and so uh, I encourage uh, folks to uh, join these local coalitions, to join No SWAT Zone, um, and try and build like a really strong anti-war uh, movement. So thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Tara, um, for that. And folks, I just um, chatted in um, the link to the War Resisters League No SWAT Zone um, campaign. So I hope people can check it out.
right, I'm going to now make you not a presenter so you can share your screen. And meanwhile, if people ask questions um, using the question feature, hopefully our um, presenters can actually be responding in the moment while others are speaking. So feel free to voice them because we won't have that much time at the end for questions. Clara, thanks for setting the context for um, the work I'm going to talk about that AROC is involved in around Stop Urban Shield, which is basically built on um, the foundation that War Resist really just set out. Um, and I thought given what this um, webinar is about and is held by the U.S. campaign that it would be good to give some context as to why AROC, an Arab and Muslim organization, is active and a leader in the Stop Urban Shield Coalition here in the Bay Area. Um, so just uh, to name specifically the reasons why we are involved in the work of, against Urban Shield, and I'll get more specific in terms of what Urban Shield actually is, but the framing uh, and the reasoning behind our work in there is because essentially we want to lift up the work against Zionism, the work against the criminalization of Arabs and Muslims, and against global repression. And so Urban Shield given that Israel plays a very strategic and instrumental role globally and locally um, in you know, providing tactics and trainings and weaponry and surveillance technology to law enforcement agencies around the world. Um, and Urban Shield is no exception. Israel does participate and also provides material and weaponry and surveillance technology in the Weapons Expo. Um, that is one reason that's an entry point for us as an Arab and Muslim organization to contribute to the work and also lift up the role of Israel in order to expose apartheid and Zionism more broadly. Secondly, um, is because of the nexus to terrorism. So the Uwasi funding that Tara spoke about is directly linked to counterterrorism, um, and in, in essence criminalizes Arabs and Muslims. And what how we understand the war on terror is further criminalizing, it's used to further criminalize black and brown communities. And so things like Urban Shield, while couched within a counterterrorism framework, essentially police and militarize poor black and brown communities more than they already are here in the United States. So as a responsibility to our work in coalition and movement building, we contribute to anti-policing work and anti-militarization work here. And lastly, um, around global repression, Urban Shield also attacks um, or targets activists and is about counter sort of dissent. Um, so for that reason, we also engage in the work to be able to support people in speaking their minds and engaging in protests and, and um, doing so unapologetically. Now, what is Urban Shield? Um, essentially, it's a weapons um, expo and SWAT training. It's coordinated by the Alameda County Sheriff's Department here in the Bay Area. Um, the sheriff is actually the mastermind behind it. It's held annually um, in the Bay Area since 2007, and it's funded by tax revenue, the Department of Homeland Security, Urban Area Security Initiative, Initiative, and by weapons manufacturers and other corporate sponsors. Now, this is important because as we talk about how we fight it, these specific details make a huge difference and also make it quite complicated. Um, it's 48 hours of consecutive um, hours of international war games competition accompanied by a weapons expo and militarization equipment trade show. And participation from the militarized police forces from around the world including Israel, Qatar, Bahrain, Singapore, South Korea, and Brazil. So several international countries and agencies participate and each year it's different. Um, and then Urban Shield activities have also been held in Boston, Massachusetts, and Austin, Texas, but both cities have discontinued their activities. Um, and Urban Shield is the largest war games and weapons expo hap um, happening currently in the world and takes place right here in the Bay Area. So for that reason, it is a main target of ours and a main target of most organizations doing work against policing and militarization here in the Bay. Um, so this chart, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but this flow chart shows how the funding works and how the authorization of Urban Shield takes place. And essentially, it starts from the Department of Homeland Security, goes through a bureaucratic process of funding going to the entire Bay Area region. The fiscal agent is San Francisco. Um, and then it goes um, basically through the Alameda County Sheriff's Office, who authorizes and also is a mastermind behind Urban Shield. 
and it's billed as an emergency preparedness activity. Now, this is important because, as Tara mentioned, there are um, many, several uh, SWAT trainings happening around the world and in the Bay Area and in around the country every single day. The part of the strategy around countering this work or challenging it or resisting it also means you have to unravel and unpack some of the propaganda around it. So one of the difficulties we've come up against is many health care workers and many emergency responders actually understand Urban Shield as this great training for emergency preparedness. And that's how it's coined and that's how they try to bill it um, and talk about it in the media and in public. Um, but it perpetuates racist and xenophobic stereotypes, increases the use of militarized weaponry and tactics in everyday law enforcement, and costs millions of dollars. Now, this T-shirt you see in this slide was the most popular item sold at Urban Shield two years ago. Um, and obviously, it says Black Rifles Matter, so it's a way to... Um, it's a way to mock Black Lives Matter. And so if you can imagine law enforcement from all over the country um, going to this weapons expo and to these vendors and purchase, and imagine them purchasing the shirt and the mentality behind that, that is the mentality that Urban Shield bolsters. That is the mentality that it normalizes. And essentially, um, that is really what Urban Shield is about, is mocking but also um, criminalizing um, black and brown and poor communities. And, and also criminalizing protest and dissent. Um, this, what you see here, is the type of gear and weaponry that is sold at Urban Shield. So, you know, one thing we always encourage people to do is actually just go to the Urban Shield website, which is the best organizing tool for anybody. And I think we'd say the same thing for most different SWAT trainings and militarization expos because all of them um, are pretty blatantly racist and xenophobic. And essentially, it leads us to things like this where you see black and brown communities um, having wars waged against them by local law enforcement on an everyday basis. The organizing strategy behind Urban Shield, um, given the complexities around the funding, um, as we showed in that flowchart, but also given that we want to, all, as an, an organization committed to lifting up the experiences of those most impacted, means that you have to be really creative and strategic in terms of how you come about um, challenging Urban Shield. So we have targeted agencies and participants, targeted in the sense of encouraging agencies not to participate. Everyone from firefighters to nurses and doctors and, and EMTs, um, police officers and so on and so forth participate in Urban Shield and many, many volunteers um, you know, voluntarily take part in these activities thinking they're doing a, a good thing for the community. So we have been doing a lot of community education in order to actually unpack what Urban Shield really is um, and to make sure that they unlearn what they were being told about it and also making sure that we're including the most impacted in that work. So as Tata mentioned with War Resisters League, we work closely around SWAT stories and collecting stories of what it actually looks like when a SWAT raid takes place and the, the impact of the community. And because Urban Shield is an international war games training and weapons expo, when we are documenting these stories, we're also documenting stories about ways in which is IDF um, attacks and terrorize Palestinians, both here and in our homelands, in ways in which they've been impacted by Israel, to make the connections between um, all sorts of different um, law enforcement and policing tactics around the world. And then we've also encouraged cities to withdraw. So our ultimate goal is to end Urban Shield. But one way to tackle it is to see if there's different cities that are interested in saying, we will not participate or have any of our agencies participate in Urban Shield, given that there's people in cities around the country that participate. And then lastly, counties as well. Um, the two main counties involved in Urban Shield is San Francisco and Alameda, but I would encourage all of you on this call from different parts of the country to also look into to see if your city or your county also participates in Urban Shield, and it might be worthwhile to see if there's ways you can pass ordinances or resolutions for them not to. So our strategy is to really um, create a wedge between the different relationships between Urban Shield and federal policy and federal agencies to cut off the power and the political power of the sheriff, the mastermind behind this, to um, also create a wedge between local city police SWAT participation and Urban Shield, the county of San Francisco and Alameda County. So we're coming at it from all different types of angles. And again, for AROC, our strategy 
with our community is to expose Israel's role in it, both in terms of making sure our Arab and Muslim community members and Palestinians who are, or solidarity activists who care about Palestine also understand that the state of Israel and Israeli military and Israeli law enforcement agencies work hand in hand with local police and you cannot be against one without being against the other and in fact it's unprincipled to do so here, especially here in the United States. So what you see here is the way in which we understand our organizing work to really create wedges and crack um, between Urban Shield and the different participating agencies and decision makers and stakeholders. And since its inception, there has been a lot of organization um, against it. Um, originally, War Resisters League came in with the idea and told us about this Urban Shield exercise and war games training. Locally, we started organizing and strategizing with them around how we could actually create a dent. And there have been some wins. So in 2014, um, and right after actually the bombing of Gaza, uh, we connected what was happening in Ferguson to all of our work, of course, um, particularly around Palestine and what was happening in Gaza. But we also decided to use all that organizing and, and energy around Gaza and against Israeli apartheid to, to push towards ending Urban Shield as well, because the war games training was happening in September, right after that summer. So um, hundreds of people mobilized um, and worked with us to challenge Urban Shield and we worked with War Resisters League on a petition to put pressure on the hotel that hosted in the city of Oakland that hosted to no longer host it and they did stop hosting it since 2014. That was a huge victory coming on the heels of a victory of Block the Boat. So being able to say yes, we're going to stop the largest Israeli Zim ship from docking at Oakland but and also we're going to stop the largest weapons expo and war um, games training from happening in Oakland. That being said, Oh, um, Oakland still participates um, and they moved Urban Shield to an area that's much more remote and much more difficult to organize around. Um, and continuing now, we are continuing to put pressure and figuring out ways for us to organize and build pressure to end Urban Shield from happening anywhere, um, let alone the Bay Area. To give you just a sense of our, our coalition structure, um, we have a strategy team made up of the most impacted communities or those who have stakes in the work, particularly Arab and Muslims. Um, and so we have AROC as a strategy team member, we have Bayan, we have Critical Resistance, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, um, and the Chicano Moratorium Coalition. So really lifting up the experiences of those impacted by police violence. We have coalition members from faith leaders and faith organizations, anti-war organizations, anti-policing, housing rights, and social and economic justice organizations from all walks of life all taking part in um, Urban Shield, including and like um, organizations like AFSC who have great research um, support and or research expertise to lend. So there's a lot of different organizations, including JVP, that are part of the coalition. And then we have broken up into various work groups and are have also been working on ways in which to develop um, alternatives to Urban Shield. So all this money that goes to Urban Shield could be going to something else. And that has been a strategy of ours for some time now. And the graph you see in front of you is a graph that we develop or report about how this um, to actually held the hands of decision makers and explain to them, although it seems so complicated given the um, flow chart we showed you around like how to track where money comes and how to stop these kinds of trainings, it's actually not that complicated and um, ethically it should be a responsibility on all decision makers to move money from one place to the other. So we created this report that lays out exactly how to do that. Um, and we've escalated. So when we realized in 2014 they moved out of Oakland, they moved it to Pleasanton, we decided there has to be other ways to make sure that they no longer host this because everyone was pointing fingers at everybody else in terms of decision makers and who could actually stop Urban Shield. So this last September at the Weapons Expo where they decided to hold it in Pleasanton, um, we shut it down. So we literally locked down all four gates that entered to the Alameda County Fairgrounds and made it so that they had to cancel one of their trainings and um, made it so that cars couldn't actually get into the fairgrounds. And we were successful um, to be able to mobilize at 7, 8 in the morning, hundreds of people to lock down the entire fairground that a militarization expo um, was a great success but also a testament of the people's commitment to making sure these kinds of trainings don't happen here. Um, and today we are trying to link what's happening with Urban Shield and with the executive orders and policies of Trump. We know that Trump is committed to increasing the militarization of police. He said literally that it's um, dangerous that there's an anti-police atmosphere in the United States. He said it's his, um, their job to make life more, com more um, difficult for the rioter, the looter, the violent disruptor. And he's also waged war very explicitly against um, gangs and people of color. All of this for us sets a precedent and sets the foundation for why 
everyone today should be against all forms of militarization and policing, given the fact that Trump has given them um, all so sorts of power and made it, made it clear that he plans on making that even worse. Um, and these are just some executive orders that speak to that exact um, thing that I laid out. Um, and lastly, we just want to make sure that people understand our, that Urban Shield is seen as a model for the rest of the country. It is the largest weapons expo. It is the largest war games training. It happens right here in the Bay Area. And Sheriff Ahern is very closely aligned with the Trump administration. He's racist. He's sexist. He's xenophobic. He's made that very clear over the years. So we understand that his work um, with Alameda County to hold Urban Shield here is a, is, is a model for the rest of the country. And our aspirations are to end it here so that things like this don't happen anywhere. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Um, just to, one last thing to say that we are currently engaged in a task force to oversee Urban Shield that one of the Board of Supervisors has put together. Um, there are different cities interested in pulling out, namely Berkeley and San Francisco, who are interested in making sure none of their agencies participate, so we're working on ordinances around that. We're also working with San Francisco as a fiscal agent to put stipulations on how it happens, um, how the funding is used, and Urban Shield not being one of them. And we're working on a lot of education around what is OASI funding, this counterterrorism funding, what does it mean in an era um, like Trump, the Trump era, where we're talking about sanctions cities, but the cities and the counties are getting money to literally wage war against black and brown community members. Um, and I'll leave it there and, and to um, Layla. Thank you for hearing us out about the Urban Shield work. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lara. I'm going to give you All right, Leila, you should be able to share your call on you and unmute you. Um, so I see there's a few people that already um, have their hands up, so I'm just going to go um, in order. So um, I see uh, Donald, I think and you were... If, if presenters want to share their webcams again, feel free. You don't need to. You won't. Um, so, Donald, I'm unmuting you if you want to go ask a few questions. Um, I didn't have a question. Oh, okay. Uh, your name, sorry. No worries. So, let me see. Okay. Uh, Josh? Josh, we can't hear you. You might be muted yourself. No question here. No worries. What if this sending? Let me try. Uh, Sydney, do you have a question? Is your, um, is your hand is raised. Maybe as a kingdom of the system. Uh, so Sydney doesn't seem to have a question, but is suggesting that people can also type in their questions. Definitely. Um, actually, I, I do. So, um, so this, someone had posted this question, but I think it's important enough to just share with everyone. So um, Maxine had asked in terms of how do we find out if there is like an urban shield or a similar type of training in our area. So um, Tara, I want, if you can, um, if you want to kind of share your answer with everyone also, and, and um, add any other details in terms of how people can find out about these things. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so there's a few ways. Um, the first, there's some kind of basic ways about like Googling your city, your town, your your uh, state, your region, and uh, keywords like tactical officers association uh, conference or um, um, or weapons expos kind of thing. But um, but beyond but beyond that. Um, if you find your your like either 
your state or regional tactical officers association they should have a schedule for the next year and you can see where they're going to be doing their trainings that's a good way um, the other thing you can do is look at the urban area security initiative uh, budget for uh, last year and see if you if your city or town is in within an urban area um, and if so that means that the funding is coming through so if you look at your city council um, meeting uh, schedule or past minutes you can see when your city council or when your board of soups is this supervisors is discussing the budget uh, the, discussing the urban area security initiative budget um, and then you can kind of backtrack from there just to get more information on what it's being spent on um, but I think Lada also might have some thoughts about um, kind of different ways to to look through No, I think Tara, you, you hit it on the nose. It's just a matter of doing that kind of basic research and then going into the weeds around um, local policy and decision makings and where the funding flow is and where it's being sent to. And just a quick follow up from Sydney. He's asking if there are like keywords um, to kind of look for in local budgets when you're searching. When it comes to um, when it comes to OWASI funding, if you go and look into, and they're actually pretty transparent. One thing we've learned, um, we've done a lot of research, as War Resisters League has helped us tremendously and very instrumental in that. Um, and now we're learning that you can actually just call up OWASI and ask a whole bunch of questions. So if you know, and that's pretty easy to find out by going on a website and you're finding out if your county or your city is actually getting OWASI funding, then you can find out if there is a tactical training simply by going on their website and seeing, because it is one of their deliverables. Um, one of the deliverables for OWASI funding is to make sure you do provide some sort of tactical training, um, and usually that's in the form of a militarization training or SWAT training and weapons expo. Um, so um, just by going on their website, giving them a call, they'll usually answer the phone and be pretty transparent. Now where there aren't, so there isn't such a clear transparency is around the decision making and how to challenge it. But in terms of what's happening, um, they aren't that, um, they don't actually seem committed to hiding that. So I would encourage people to just look into OWASI funding in your county, um, look on their website and then make some phone calls. Thank you. Um, and Lara, actually, you, I wanted to ask something in terms of you had mentioned near the end of your presentation about how kind of the work you're doing, connecting it to the you know the sanctuary cities um, movement, and um, if you have ideas because obviously I think sanctuary cities is becoming a very you know popular you know has been for a long time um, an important part of organizing and now is kind of getting renewed interests and people looking at to expand what the meaning of a sanctuary city means so. What kind of um, tips are you looking at locally to make sure to make the connections between the work around police militarization and these kind of SWAT um, expos and sanctuary city? Well, here in the Bay Area, and I'm sure around the country, um, there's been a lot of conversation around how to expand the under the idea, definition, and the practice of sanctuary beyond just non-compliance, but actually intervention and then <coughs> acting in resistance any sort of um, attacks by law enforcement and also um, the fact that it's no longer as simple as understanding that ICE is going to show up at someone's door. Oftentimes the ways in which immigrants in particular are being attacked and other communities of color, it's a combination of all forms of law enforcement. DEA, um, you know, the Custom and Borders Patrol, it could be the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, it could be your local police, it could be ICE. So the very um, nature of the environment and the context that we are living in at the moment is not as simple as sanctuary being you know, we will not give information to ICE. It has to actually mean we are not going to engage in the collaborations of it and the information sharing of any law enforcement agencies, and in particular at a time when law enforcement agencies are tasked 
um, with um, you know actually enacting and playing out and enforcing racist laws and policies, including attacking very blatantly immigrants, poor people, and black and brown communities very explicitly, then it is a responsibility on all our parts to expose the role of militarization in this case. So if they are being trained to treat people like enemy combatants, then that alone sort of supports our work around sanctuary to expose the fact that these trainings are happening where law enforcement is being taught all forms of law enforcement, including those who are supposed to be supporting with the health and well-being of community members like emergency responders, um, are being trained to treat people like enemy combatants. And then we also have a, a moment where law enforcement is tasked with attacking immigrants and people of color very explicitly, then we are making the connections that way. And this is the first time I would say since we've been involved in Urban Shield, that local decision makers are actually putting to question funding. Um, never before were they ever interested in stopping any sort of funding from any source. They all take money from anywhere. That's always the logic that we have come up against. But for once, they're saying, do we want this counterterrorism money? Do we want this money coming from the federal government? What kind of strings are attached to that? They are putting to question things they never did before. So I do think it's a very prime moment for organizing against militarization and policing more broadly and making connections um, across all communities around both the role of FBI, but the role of ICE, the role of police, and, and actually exposing those collaborations. Thank you. Um, and then I see Dennis has chatted in a question um, that's talking about um, asking general intersectionality of movements and particularly interaction between Black Lives Matter and um, and Palestinians and kind of around anti-militarist uh, anti-militarist activist collaboration amongst the two groups. So um, and he's looking kind of comments on that and if there's like what kind of interactions are happening and collaborations. And well, I guess I would agree. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, um, I think there's no way to do work against policing or and specifically the militarization of policing without addressing anti-blackness um, and supporting the movement for black lives. Um, so that's inherent in any work and if it's not then it should be and must be um, put to question and with some reflection around it. Now what that looks like on the ground, um, we have um, definitely cooperated and collaborated and, and participated um, very closely in different activities against policing that are held by Anti-Police Terror Project, Black Lives Matter, um, and local iterations of Black Lives Matter. Um, in addition, the, the recent shutdown included the way we envision, I totally hear what Layla was sharing about not putting people on the front lines, especially those most impacted who could be but vulnerable in terms of direct action. And that is something we have to always be super intentional about and careful. Um, with this last direct action that Stop Urban Shield took, that took part last fall, the way in which it worked is we did have you know, a third world um, contingent. Um, we call the third world resistance contingent, which included people from Black Lives Matter, which included people from Arab liberation movements, which included people from the Chicano and indigenous communities and the API communities and so on and so forth. So we made sure to also highlight those most impacted in the messaging, but also in the actual work and the practice of organizing against Urban Shield. Um, and so one way we try to show that solidarity is both by making sure we're addressing the root cause of the issue, which is policing, and its role in devastating black communities specifically in this country. So Urban Shield and our work, a uh, point of unity is that we are against policing, period and we are for abolition of policing now, but in terms of our goals for Urban Shield, it's to end Urban Shield. And so we all come around the table as a coalition for that specific goal, but never to prop up or to undermine the work of anti-policing and abolition work happening in this country. Um, and then lastly, the intersectionality just shows in the ways in which we make sure to lift up third world or black and brown communities more broadly. Thank you, Lara. Um, Marin, I think you have your hand up, so I'm going to unmute you. Is this working now? Yes, you hear we can. Oh, perfect. Uh, thanks for the seminar webinar in the first place. And I just have a quick question as well about uh, intersectionality. I'm, 
I've just had uh, five amazing days uh, with uh, communities in Rio de Janeiro who are as well heavily uh, affected by police violence and as well police trained uh, in fact by uh, in urban shield and one of the things that came out in mobilizing there was uh, that it is very powerful and as well very shocking to see how much of the <coughs> phenomenology, the, the scenes that I've been living for years in Palestine, I see them uh, uh, playing out in the favelas in Rio and other places. And uh, one of the things uh, we've been uh, starting to work on there is uh, really trying as well to show how within this global structure of militarization where Israel has a key role in it, People at the end of the day, for different reasons, whether that is because of uh, Israeli apartheid uh, or because of uh, uh, racism uh, and uh, capitalist interests, uh, are suffering uh, similar ways of repression. And we are trying to think about ways how to as well visually and impactfully highlight that. So I was wondering over the years of uh, campaigning and trying to build up these ties, did you develop uh, ways of working with communities in that way, showing really how uh, the impact of uh, militarization and uh, the, the joint training brings uh, uh, similar effects on communities and how do you do that? Are there any models uh, that you have developed? Tara might want to speak about the SWAT stories and the role of that in some of that work. Okay. Yeah, and um, uh, I was actually going to shout at Leila because I think this is where art um, and creativity really like is, is the model. Um, but something I just didn't have time for earlier is kind of to think about the, the U.S.-Israeli um, um, tactical uh, tra transfers and, and tactic swapping that happen a lot. So for example, um, uh, and, and I think the U.S. and Israel are really particular in that relationship too. I think a lot of governments do tactical swapping. Um, but for example, when um, Atlanta Mayor Reed was called on to cut ties with, with Israeli police, um, he said, because Atlanta Police Department had been sending personnel to Israel since 1992, he said, um, Police, he said that, it, it, that he couldn't because this was such a funda fundamental relationship. And then he kind of listed what he what he felt they, the Atlanta police were benefiting so deeply from that long-standing relationship. And it was things like, for example, um, did you know that U.S. police keep the red and blue lights on their cruisers flashing at all times so that their present is, presence is felt? That actually is an Israeli tactic. Um, uh, stockpiling skunk water. Um, it, the St. Louis Department started stockpiling skunk water. Actually, that uh, that was borrowed from Israeli forces. Um, the NYPD's demographic unit that was systematically spying on Muslims um, that was from Israeli authorities uh, in in occupied West Bank. So there's like the list is huge around the amount of tactics and weapons that have been transferred. And I think because some of them are so visual, um, I I think. I don't know about the model necessarily, but I think there's like a lot of opportunities for using art and 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 visuals to to show those comparisons um, beyond just the weaponry um, that's being sold. Like for example, Safari Land, you know, weaponry that's been sold in the United States and in Israel. But I don't know if you have more thoughts about art, you know. So. Lila, can you, if you're talking, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's not only, sorry, I forgot about that. It's not only, um, it's not only visuals. Uh, part of it, it's the whole messaging around the whole thing. Um, so we also thought really strategically about what kinds of chants we were using. Um, and in the chants, like lifting up, Sim you know, different struggles simultaneously. Um, you know, thinking about um, visually what kinds of banners um, you know what 
what words we were going to put on the banner, so how we were going to frame it in a way that was like intentionally very intersectional, highlighting different geographic areas um, within those banners. So listing different cities that are all impacted by militarization. Um, and then um, it's also important to note, just like I guess if we're talking about models and centering those most impacted, I mean, it doesn't even have to be just visually. Like um, when we were working on Stop by Toa, um, it was a lot of coalitions of people who are impacted, you know, so you have to have people who are impacted organizing the action and therefore the framing of it will be, you know, shaped by those people's experiences or knowledge or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but it's all of the messaging, but the messaging comes from those who are organizing it, so it's important to have those most impacted organizing the action. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone um, so much for joining us tonight. Um, thanks again to Tara, um, Lara, and Leila um, for your wonderful um, words and your presentations. Um, I think several people had asked if the presentations will be available and um, if, our, if both Tara and Lara agree, we will definitely be happy to share with them. Uh, we also will share what we, um, the parts that we did record with everyone, so you will have them to watch again and share with your own groups um, and for your own organizing purposes. And if folks want to, and we'll upload it as well on our website um, at USCPR. Um, so thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much, Rama, for having us all. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Yeah.